students, challenging them, supporting them, tying real stories, telling stories about history rather than giving just the facts about history. Those are the kinds of things that will lead to long-term memory. Um, anytime the emotions are engaged, uh, there's more learning likely to be happening. Just a couple of more. We have two ways of organizing memory. Spatial, which registers our daily experience, and rote, which deals with facts and skills in isolation. Both of these serve a purpose, and I'm not saying that there isn't a time when there should be some rote learning, but we understand best when facts are embedded in natural spatial memory. The implications are that activities that call for students to use their knowledge doing something, hands-on projects, tend to build memory. Um, think about when you learn to ride a bicycle. You may have read books about bicycles, watched watch somebody else ride it, um, seen videos, whatever, but until you actually got on the bike and tried it yourself, you didn't really learn how to do that. Same with knitting. If any of you are knitters, you can read all the magazines in the world and you don't understand how to make the stitches work unless you actually pick up the needles and do it yourself. So um, the, ro the, mem the memory only gets activated by the actual doing of it. And the next one is learning engages the whole body. All learning is mind-body. Movement, foods, attention, cycles, and chemicals modulate learning. Um, there's a physiology researcher at um, Georgetown University Medical Center named Candace Pert, and she's done a lot of research on how the chemicals inside our bodies form a dynamic information network linking mind and body. Um, She's written a lot about finding peptides, for example, which are uh, um, protein uh, modules of pro or nucleus of protein all over the body, including um, in the intestine. So when you get a gut reaction to something, she says you should pay attention to that. That's not, that's not just an old phrase, but it actually means if your body has a physical reaction to something, that's something your mind should be paying attention to because those peptides carry messages back and forth to the brain and they're all over our body. So we learn using our hands, our feet, using every part of our body. The implications for schools are that we, we should make decisions as though we believe that students mature at different rates because everybody is different and takes in information differently. Incorporate facets of health, stress management, nutrition, exercise into the learning process. This means that we teach students to negotiate the best learning conditions for themselves because it's not one size fits all and yet a student will find himself in a classroom where the same thing is being given to every single student. So he needs to learn to figure out how to negotiate his way through that rigid system and so we, that in a way that lets him respect what's happening in his own body. And the last one is each brain is uniquely organized. The brain structure is actually changed by learning. Your brain today looks different physiologically than it looked two years ago or even last week because neurons are growing. It's changing by the, the experiences that you have. Howard universities, how, Harvard University's Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences has encouraged many teachers to design multifaceted strategies to engage a wide variety of student abilities and interests which means suggests that you give students choices for ways to show what they know. University of North Carolina Medical School Mel Levine's book, A Mind at a Time, has helped teachers be more mindful of student developmental differences. We now know that the brain grows new neurons and develops new neural pathways throughout life. There was a time, even say 10 years ago, when people believed that the neurons you were born with were the ones you had for all time. And when you lost them, if you did drugs or whatever, if you lost some of those neurons, they were gone for good. We now know from the, re, the technological, technological advances that they use in science and medicine that you can, in fact, grow new neurons. So your brain is capable of growing. There have been a lot of studies about stroke victims, for example, where one side of the brain is damaged, and they've found that the other side of the brain picks up the activities that that side was doing, and eventually the other side can, not fully in, in some cases, but can begin to develop the neurons to, make, to regrow itself. So the, the brain is an amazingly um, adaptive um, organ. At the end of the day, the important fact is the teacher's role is to understand the student and how he or she learns. 
Brain research suggests that the teacher's role is much more complex than believed before. You can't give the same lesson to a group of 30 students and wonder why 15 of them aren't with you. You need to know every one of your students and know what, know what their learning styles are in order to be able to reach them. So, now it's your turn. I want you to take two minutes and talk to your neighbor about brain research's impact on teaching. Let me give you a, a question to think about. What are the implications of brain research for teacher preparation? And what does it suggest for the changing role of the school director? So talk to your neighbor or listen to your neighbor. I'll give you two minutes. <coughs> Okay, let's fa finish up your conversations, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's move on now to the second area of reform that I'd like to talk about, which is closely related to brain research. And that is constructivism. How many of you know constructivism? You've seen that term before? A few people. Okay. Socrates is our hero. <laughs> Constructivism, is, as an educational theory, is an approach that begins with what the student already knows and proceeds with activities that allow the learner to actively construct or build his own understanding. The teacher is a facilitator in this process in which students' understandings determine the sequence of activities. This again requires that the teachers know the students really well. There are three basic tenets in constructivism, and before you dismiss it as being too out there to do. I just want you to, to stay with me through the, through the um, discussion of it. The three basic tenets of constructivism. First is a construction of understanding. We're not talking about uh, information, but understanding. Knowledge or understanding is something that students must construct for and by themselves. Knowledge cannot be transmitted or given. Information can be transmitted from the teacher to the student. Whether or not that information becomes knowledge depends on what the student does with it. Whether their activity is set up so the student can actually make, move it from the information level into real knowledge. The process of constructing one's own knowledge leads to the acquisition of conceptual understanding of the underlying concepts. 